All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to start. Um, we're going to do community announcements a little bit later on the agenda. We have three presentations tonight, so I want to give them plenty of time to present and answer questions. Um, after our presentations, we'll have community updates. And then after that is when Council Member Pui, the mayor's office, and our city officials will go. I have not heard if we will have any of our state elected officials with the legislative session just ending. I'm assuming many of them are on vacation. Hopefully they're on vacation, uh, getting some R&R. &R. Uh, but if any of them come, they will round out the agenda at the end of the night. Uh, and then we only have a little bit of council business. We have four empty board seats. I'll call on you just one second. Uh, we have four empty board seats. We'll be nominating one tonight. Um, and if anyone here is interested, we can take those nominations. What? I don't think they can hear. We need to have folks move up then. The mic? I don't have a mic. The, the mic is on, it's just far so away. So we're, okay. uh, we're just going over general business right now, and then we'll have people speak into the mic in just a moment. Yeah. You got to move up front if you can't hear. Yeah. Sorry. The old people need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we have on the agenda the pickleball initiative? That is, uh, that'll be a question for Council Member Pui, okay. but we have time on the agenda to talk about it. Okay, good. Um, so we are going to start with the Spark Environmental Justice Lab. Bring my laptop. Okay. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Piper Christian and I'm the Community Engaged Learning Coordinator for the Spark Environmental Justice Lab. Um, and so what our program does, we are working at the University of Utah and we collaborate with community partners to um, provide different uh, air quality provisions um, around Salt Lake County. So you'll notice in the back of the room, we have a air purifier currently running. Um, and we had a great time collaborating with Brooke from the library on different air quality provisions here. Uh, for example, this past November, um, we ran a DIY air purifier event um, in which we provided about 20 uh, low cost air purifiers um, to Glendale community members. So we just wanted to give an announcement about a program that we're currently managing. Um, we are doing an air filter exchange program. So just a, a bit of the basics about who we are. Um, I'm collaborating with Dr. Daniel Mendoza, who's an air quality researcher at the University of Utah. Um, and then also working um, with um, partners from NeighborWorks. You can see some present here. Um, and so NeighborWorks is putting us in uh, contact with different community councils um, to spread the word about our program. Um, so some details, and can everyone hear me? Could that, Should I move this up? I realize- I can uh, lift okay. it a little bit. Thanks. Maybe just shift it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Awesome. Okay, that seems oh much better. Okay, <laughs> wonderful. So a little bit of the details about our program. So this will help residents and researchers better understand the amount and type of indoor air pollutants that exist within the 84104 and 84116 zip codes, um, while also improving indoor air quality. So after recruiting participants in our program, we will be sending one to two university students um, an air quality researcher, Dr. Mendoza, along with a certified HVAC technician to visit homes and exchange um, your old air filters in your home for brand new um, high efficiency air filters. And so uh, why do we do this? Um, improving air filter, changing out the air filters in your home can improve indoor air quality in your home by up to 65%. And it's recommended that you change your air filters roughly every three months. So, um, and a pack of three filters usually costs about $30, um, but we will be providing these um, to residents for free who participate in the program. And so what this would entail is we will be collecting simple survey data that will be made anonymous um, about um, community perceptions and uh, experiences with air quality. And then we will be gathering some air quality readings in your home to see if this intervention improves air quality. Um, and then we will also be looking at the contents of your old air filter and reporting back to you um, maybe some of the pollutants that we looked at from our research. And the number one priority is that all of this comes into a public report that will be then shared back with the community members so that we can um, learn from this program. Um, and then finally, in terms of uh, when it will be happening, 
um, for, so we're kind of grouping different um, communities together. And so um, for Glendale, uh, Poplar Grove and Jordan Meadows, we will be doing it, I believe in the um, April 17th and April 24th from five to 7 p.m. is when we'll be visiting homes for those who are participating and changing out air filters. And uh, yeah, and lastly, um, yeah, so I just, um, so what I have is um, this nice PDF and I brought some flyers. Um, and so I will be staying after the meeting. And if you're interested in participating in this program, you'll get some air quality information as well as these free air filters. Um, and so I will be staying after and I'm happy to give out flyers or you can scan our QR code and sign up tonight. So thank you. That sounds awesome. Yeah. How many homes participants do you that's a great question. So this is a pilot program. So we're keeping it relatively small um, for this spring with the intention that we could waitlist families who are interested and they could participate in the fall for a larger scale program. So we're looking for roughly um, four to six uh, families from each community. So um, four to six from Glendale, four to six from, um, from Poplar Grove, et cetera. Um, so yeah, space is somewhat limited. Um, so we encourage uh, sign up early if you're interested. And the deadline to sign up is April 1st. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Tim from the other side village. Is that a remote slide? Uh, no, that's just a remote. We'll have you just uh, give Landon the signal when you're ready. What time do you want me to wrap up? Uh, you have, I have you on for 20 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's really Wonderful to be here. My name is Tim Stay. I'm the CEO of the Other Side Village. You may have heard about the Other Side Village. It's it's a planned development that we're working to build on Indiana Avenue on the other side of Redwood Road, in between Redwood Road and I-215. We're going to have and Could you raise the mic? Certainly. I'm using the tiny. Yeah, and let me give. Let's go to the next slide. I'll tell you what's going to be in this first phase. Sorry, one second. It's not clicking forward. Sorry, uh, I don't want to see that. <laughs> Share screen. So it's going to be in phase one, we're going to have uh, 60 homes. These are going to be between 250 and 400 square feet. There'll be little co cottage homes that um, is, uh, the residents are going to pay rent. So it'll be for people who've um, struggled with being homeless, people who have uh, mental health challenges. On site, we're going to have a medical and mental health clinic that they can get treatment um, right there on site. So. They can get stabilized with, with their medications, stabilized with their treatment. Um, we'll have a small neighborhood center where they can gather together. Um, we're also doing a small 21 unit um, individual cottage hotel. So people can, from the from outside the area can come and do nightly rental um, in there. And that helps generate revenue for, to cover the operations of the village. And it will also, provide employment for the people living in the village. Um, we'll have a social enterprise building and we'll have a small bodega style grocery store as part of part of the village. So this is um, this got approved by the Salt Lake City Council last fall. We're now working on the plan development and that's part of what we're here is to share with you. We're going to go before the planning commission and we have Riley and Amy from Salt Lake City, who are part of the planning department, who are helping shepherd the process through. And we're here to answer questions as we go before the planning commission. Let me get through the slides and then if you have questions, we might answer some of them. Let's go to the next slide. So what needs to do before we can start to build? One, we have to complete some environmental steps. The Utah the state of Utah, the Department of Environmental Quality is taking a look at the land, making sure it's appropriate for residential use. And we have, have so we've been doing extensive testing and we're going through that process. Next, we have to complete the plan development with Salt Lake City. And once we've got approval from the Planning Commission and have met all the requirements, <clears throat> we can obtain a building permit and start building. 
Next slide. Timeline, we hope, we're, we're hoping that we can get site permit late spring, early summer. Um, we begin work on the site, the roads, the sidewalks, uh, foundations through the summer. And we're really working to try to get people into, uh, into homes before winter hits next year. So we can get people in someplace warm. Next slide. Uh, just more details on the environmental status. We've entered a voluntary cleanup program with the state uh, um, as partners with Salt Lake City and us. Um, they're the regulatory entity that's going to determine, you know, if make sure that we've met all the requirements to make sure the land's safe. We've hired Terracon, which is an environmental testing agency. They've been doing the tests that that's, has been directed by the state, and they're preparing a remedial action plan of there's to take care of a few areas of concern, um, and that action plan will be a proper disposal of, of some areas of concern, uh, some great vapor barriers, and then ongoing monitoring of the site. Next slide. Um, the plan development issue, we're, we're really looking at three things with the plan development. Let's look at the next slide. The first one is um, in a typical development, you have one home and it's on a piece of property and the home next to it is on a separate piece of property. Here, we're going to have multiple homes all on one piece of property. And so with the zone um, being having multiple homes buildings and having different configurations of the buildings, um, we need to increase the housing density on the property. So we're proposing some duplex. Here's just a single home. Here's uh, duplexes. This one's a quad, but they're all, each one is about, you know, between that 250 and 400 square feet. So that's one of the things that we're, we're asking the planning commission to allow us to, to do. Let's go to the next one. The next thing we're asking um, exceeding the minimum front yard setback. So um, normally you would have a home with a certain setback from the public street. Um, since this is all one parcel, we've got homes. Here's the public street on Indiana Avenue. We've got homes far away from it. So we're not, we're not directly facing a public street. We're far away from, from that. So we're looking for um, accommodation on on this, and then the last one is um, building entries do not face a public street or parkway. So we've we've organized these into small neighborhoods of about thirty homes. You notice we have the front porch all facing a common area. So again, one of the things we're really trying to do is create community, create connection, so people can walk out their front door and see their neighbor and across the way. Um, but that's not facing a public street and that's different than what the code says. So we're asking to say with this architectural design of trying to help create community, we're asking for um, these and all the roads within the village will be private roads will be part of a gated community. We'll, we'll have a security access. We want to keep the those who would want to do harm outside of the community, outside of coming in and preying on some of some of our most vulnerable friends and neighbors. The next uh, part, neighborhood impact, you know, how we're going to have 24 hour security um, monitoring both within the village and the surrounding property around the village. Um, we're going to put a sidewalk along that portion of Indiana Avenue. There isn't any sidewalk right now. We're coordinating with Salt Lake City to connect with the Nine Line Trail. Um, and, and then we also are going to have employment opportunities for, for uh, people in the larger community that not all of our employment will be from inside the village. Some of it will, but some will also, we're looking for people. And one I could tell you about that we're excited that's coming up uh, in a few months. If we can go to the next one is we're getting ready to launch the other side donuts. So we're going to bring a donut shop. This is at 760 
south on Redwood Road. So it's just around the corner from where the village will be. And we hope to open in um, June and we're actually starting to hire people. So if you know anyone who's interested in a job, you can contact me and my emails on the next slide here and they'll be fantastic donuts. I, I'm sure you'll love to come and participate. But again, it creates employment opportunities for our residents. It helps generate revenue to cover the costs of, of our operations. So I'm happy to take any questions if you want to email me. More information you find on our website or Facebook pages. And now I'll be glad to answer questions. Yes, in the back. Yes. It's it's primarily oriented to adults. Um, we found that there's lots of resources for um, uh, families and children who are homeless, for those who are struggling on the streets with mental health or medical health. There's not as many resources, and that's that's the target. If um, we most of them will be single, but we do anticipate some will be couples and some may maybe will have um, a child, but mostly um, the people that we're finding in this category, if they have children, they're already adult children. Yes, sir. I had two questions. Number one, while well, you have the map, I, I'm not quite getting how that map lays out in relationship to the city and your plan. Could you- uh, As far as the map? location? Well, the location is on Indiana Avenue, but I'm just trying to look at your map and decide if the horizontal street going up and down the side of the map is Indiana. For no, sure. sure. I think I think it was um, right right here. So Indiana Avenue is down here, Redwood Road is over here, and I two fifteen is over here. So this would be within inside the property, and that's a road that. Um, allows a fire truck to come through or other vehicles to come through, but the public road is out so here. Not, not so yeah, it's yeah. north facing. It's yeah. it's a long, narrower parcel. Um, so that's why the the unit and again this is phase one. We hope to build additional homes uh later, but we have to show that this model works in that. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, but I'm not seeing where you can get fire engine access to the center of those houses. You can get it to the perimeter, yeah, we, but you know, how do you get that, you know, emergency access into the interior where those houses sit? Yeah, we, we've worked, talked to Salt Lake City Fire. There, our plans are being reviewed by them. They have certain requirements of how far each home is from a, ro a drivable road that they can drive on. And so we'll make sure we meet all of those requirements. But um, these, this road, is, uh, they'll be able to drive on this road, they'll be able to drive on. So between these, they'll be able to reach these homes in the middle. And we meet the, the city requirements there. Other questions? Yes. Uh, um, any plan for fencing? Yes. Well. Um, there's already an existing fence along this this border. We'll, we're going to put a, a row of trees because it's facing an auto parts place, try to create some uh, a green barrier between the two. Um, we'll fence this area off here where the homes are and require a, a security access to get into it. And we can then control visitors and things like that. That's great. What a good plan. Thank you. So that's all foot traffic then it's going to get to the homes? Yeah, if someone needs, uh, you know, a handicap and needs, we do have a few parking stalls, but from visiting other communities, about 10% of the residents we anticipate will have cars. The other 90% will be primarily foot traffic. But we do have parking out here if, if we have other visitors that come. Um, and I guess bikes too. Yeah, uh, bikes. Uh, what is this unit below that one street? This here uh -uh. or okay. here? A little higher, right there. Right here. Yeah. This is where the that twenty one unit uh, hotel. Cottage. Those are the hotel unit. Yes. 
And then this will be the, the medical and mental health clinic. And then this is the social enterprise building that will provide on-site employment. Yes. Um, why did you guys, from what I saw earlier plans is you had a lot less homes on those areas. What happened in that change that and makes it more, why did you make it more dense? I feel like that was like what was kind of, has been sold to our community from the beginning. And now it seems like you're kind of changing that, um, you know, how has the density been increased? Yeah, the density is significantly yeah. um, As our original plans, uh, um, when we looked at the space, we understood that we would have more space. But as we've gotten in and done the testing, um, just north of this is a fault line that the state discovered last spring, so we had to adjust and move homes out of that area. There's a, a, a large um, uh, sewer line that the city has, and we have to be 30 feet on each side of it. So as we came to understand kind of these restrictions, it reduced the total amount of area. And again, uh, our purpose is to try to, how can we help as many people? We think this finds the balance between uh, not overly dense and having enough space, but still having some density that we can uh, accommodate as many as we can. So it it was um, mostly based upon the constraints that we found with the property. Yes, How many sir. units are gonna be on that project? 60 units. I don't know if, um, if anything you want from Salt Lake City, our representatives from Riley and Amy. So mainly one person per house. Primarily, but we, we anticipate some will be couples. Um, I was just going to follow up to the last question that was asked about the density of the housing. Another thing to add is that as part of the rezone, the city council required some um, specific things on the site, one of those being that it had to have a minimum of 60 housing units. So that is a requirement um, that was part of the rezone. Additionally, um, the um, businesses in front, as well as the community grocery store, those were all specific requirements that were in the rezone. And sorry, I didn't introduce mm -hmm. myself. I'm Amy from the planning division, and this is Riley. She's the one processing the petition. Uh, any other questions? Do you have any other comments you want to make? So right now, the project is going through a noticing period called early engagement. Um, and that noticing period is required to last 45 days. So that will be up on April 16th. And then a planning commission meeting. Sorry, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Do you want me to repeat what I said? OK, so I'll just go over what I just said. The project is going through a noticing period called early engagement right now, and that noticing period is required to last 45 days. So that period will be over on April 16th, and a planning commission meeting can be held after the noticing period has ended. So we don't have a date set exactly for that planning commission. We just know it will be sometime after April 16th. And you will all receive a notice in advance of that meeting with instructions on how you can participate. Um, so other than that, we can take any questions that you may have about the city process. Yeah. What is the status of the property in Europe and west of where this uh, unit is going in? The status of the property, like, do you mean like the former dump site or? Yes. Okay, so. It's kind of hard without like an aerial image to describe. So like Tim. Give me one second, yeah, I'll pull okay. it up. <laughs> and I'll, I'll point out. I got it. It'll take me just a okay, second. That's so, just fine. Gotta pull this back over. Does this detach? Oh, yeah, okay. you should be able to lift it up. That on one side of that property, the city has a solar array. I don't believe it's a solar array. It's some 
it's a city building. I want to say it's like public works, like a public it's works facility there. Building, yeah. yeah. It's, it's on the north side of the it's right next to I-215. Yeah. A small solar panel farm there. And that, that was built by the city to power their public safety building, from what I understand. Um, so uh, that whole part that's elevated is we're not touching it. We're staying Sorry. away from that because that was that was the historic landfill. It's about 17 feet higher than the part we're building on, and it's it's buried under five feet of Dirt. It was last used in 1962, so it's been 60 years since it's been used, but we're still staying away from I'm the landfill sorry. part. The part we have, in many cases, it's still native soil that we're looking at. Nothing's ever been built on it. So we're looking at eight acres in phase one that we've identified a total of 38 acres. If we can, um, uh, if we can are given the opportunity to expand that we can just build the whole uh, development. I'd stop sharing for there. Okay. So, um, and then north of that is the Salt Lake City has a row of, of different properties, uh, the public utility, public works buildings along 500 South. This is driving me crazy. We're getting there. So the, the short answer is nothing is happening with those other and I were just talking about the phase one area of the property, um, which is that area that was identified in the site plan note. There's a map. Okay. Here we go. So you have this like. Oh, I was just going to say, ideally, I think the applicant, you know, intends to potentially do phase one or phase two and phase three, but those subsequent phases would need to go to city council for approval. So right now we're just talking about the redevelopment of phase one of the site. So here's the whole property. This whole area is owned by the city. The parcel boundary is like halfway across. So this upper part is all like city parks and public lands and some other city facilities. So this half of the site is the area that we're talking about um, that the other side village will be utilizing. So this area, here and then over on this west side of I-215 is formerly a landfill that's been abandoned and buried. So that's why they're required to go through all these remediation processes with the state. So most of that landfill area is over here closer to I or I-215. So it will minimally affect the area that will be developed for the other side village. The other side village is going to be in this southeast corner of the property and we'll go about to about right here just this strip right here and like tim said this is a pilot project so hopefully it will expand in the future but right now the proposal that we have is only for that area i'm sorry I have to say, so what you're saying is originally city council said 30 homes but you kind of expanded to 60 homes no so when the very first part of this process is to go through a rezone process because this whole parcel was originally zoned as public lands. So he had to change the zone to something that would allow for this project. And city council required a minimum of 60 units to be included in this pilot project. So that's what the proposal is. It includes at least 60 units. And it's always been 60 units. Yes. So it hasn't changed. That's that's what my clarification okay. was. Yeah. Because I explained. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Linda, are you here? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Linda Brown. I don't need a microphone, as you can tell. Yes, if you have a question right out of the gate. Can you still hear? Just hear. Is this better? Oh, okay. I generally people generally say don't use that. So I'm grateful uh, for your input there. Thank you so much. My name is Linda Brown. I am with an organization called Kids Read, and we are looking to put uh, 
our read and succeed little neighborhood libraries in people's um, in the neighborhoods along in Glen, uh, Glendale here. And our libraries are 24 seven libraries that reside within your property line. And it allows children and parents in, in that neighborhood to come and access books uh, for ages and uh, grades levels one through six. We already have one of our read and succeed libraries just up the street on um, Emory. Uh, it gets a lot of traffic. We are always filling that with books. It's been a huge success. Uh, we're a little over a year in, um, in our life cycle of Kids Read, and we put in a 23 libraries in the ground, and we are so excited to be uh, involved in coming into the uh, Glendale area, and to, we want to saturate you with lots of libraries, so kids all over can uh, have access to books. These are books that, that they won't find and get to take home from school. And we're finding that so many children don't understand and maybe even their parents don't understand how important it is to have uh, outside of school reading books in order to enhance their educational process. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. And tonight we're asking for people who would say, you know, I'd want to know more about that idea. I might want to host a library in my yard and I uh, definitely uh, would like to talk and, and develop more information on that. So I brought brochures and after this meeting is over, I will be at the back of the room and I will uh, entertain your questions and such. At, at this time, you wanna have a question? Yeah, what do these libraries look like? Well, let me just hand you this. <laughs> They're colorful, they're exciting, they're filled with all kinds of books that children would appreciate and like. Got this. Oh, thank you. I actually was gonna bring a, a I thought I had in my car a poster, but can you see this little library right here? This family, this is a family in Murray. And this is, it, that's a library and it holds up to 150 books. And sometimes those books, if you want to know, just. Just, <laughs> do you want to stand up and talk about your library yeah. in your yard? Come up here and tell us about the one in your neighborhood that we put in your yard that we just came down and refilled. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I have one uh, just around the corner on Emory Street and um, I put it in and I didn't know like what the kids were going to do. And like, I've just told a couple kids like in the neighborhood, oh, hey, come by, get the books. And it's been like, people come all the time and get books. And I've had to refill it twice already with books. And so I'm also like obsessed with now getting books and um, other things. And it's like completely free. Like they come and put it in your yard. And it's just really fun because it like builds community and the kids love it. And it's just like, I'm going to make a little bench for it and have kids like a place for kids to come and sit and hang out. So it just like creates community. And I didn't tell you this yet, but well, I don't know. I, well, the public library said they would help us get more books. Mm, so, great. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like a free, like, come and grab what you want and read it and bring it back. And sometimes they disappear, but, like, honestly, I'm kind of like, you know, like, just get the books in their hands, you know? So, yeah. Is that the library provide books? Or you can? Yeah, you don't provide the books. We are not affiliated with any library, with any school. We are a standalone organization that is simply putting these libraries out in neighborhoods that we think would benefit from them. And uh, we had met uh, yesterday with uh, the um, University of Utah, what's it called? Yeah, neighborhood partners. And, and we're putting some over there and in kind of over in that area that's over here on 17th. So we'll be placing some libraries there. So we, and they said, oh, there's a meeting tomorrow, which was tonight. I was oh, absolutely. We want to go and let the citizenry know that we, you know, we're here to, to provide whatever you, you all need in the form of reading material. And on the bottom of our library, it says uh, read and return. But if it doesn't get returned, we are fine with that. We, if, you, if a child finds a book that's their favorite book, great. And the other thing that we're also providing, if it, if the neighborhood requires it, is bilingual books. We're having some Spanish English books too, because perhaps the parent um, doesn't read English and the child is learning it. That you know they can still both enjoy the book and, and take uh, and be involved in it at the same time together. So. So they're good wholesome. 
Oh, we, their entry level grade one. Yes, if we went into a neighborhood, my the one on my home, um, I'm in an older neighborhood, so there's most, and it's just being repopulated with uh, young families. So mine have some uh, grade or age three to age six books in it because we have a younger profile. And if that's what you need, then that's what we will provide. Okay, so we're here to just make your kids happy and educated and read and have a good time at it as well. So I'll be in the back afterwards if you have any questions or would like a brochure of your own. Thank you. Um, all right, we'll do some community updates really quick. Uh, are you representing Sorensen? Yep. Cool. I'll have so, you go up to the mic. So I'm going to just share my screen. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you could scroll up. Okay, so I am representing the Sorensen Unity Center tonight. Um, over at the Sorensen Center, it's a, a center that is built to be able to provide goods for us for free. Um, one of their charters is to make things free for the public. So they have a ton of really great programs that are always happening there. Um, that is small enough. I cannot see it. Um, <laughs> I can't figure out how to zoom it. I'll figure yeah, it out. sorry. Um, oh, I'm Landon Krasik. I'm the secretary here in Glendale, and I also work at the Sorensen Center. Um, what was that? Sorensen Unity Center. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that we're doing right now is we are uh, have VITA there that provides free tax help for anyone who wants to stop by and get their taxes done. As long as you make less than $60,000 a year, then they can do your taxes for free, um, which is a great resource. I'm doing it myself. Um, they have uh, a fol folkloric dance. I'm not going to try that first word. I think it's not. I'm not trying it. Um, but they are there every Tuesday and Monday and Tuesday uh, evening, and it's just an opportunity for people to dance and hang out in the community. Um, Moondi piano lessons and voice classes are free every Saturday. Come and take piano classes for free. Um, uh, the wellness bus is there every Tuesday from three to seven. Come get a health check again, free. Um, the IRC citizenship classes are happening. So if you know someone who is trying to apply for citizenship, um, they're teaching classes to help people be able to get citizenship here in the US. Um, and then there's also Salt Lake City uh, discounted dental, um, discounted and uh, donated dental. So depending on your income bracket, you can get dental work done for free at the Unity Center. Um, which is very helpful. Um, tomorrow night, Planned Parenthood is hosting an event to talk about the new changes that are happening in the state dealing with abortion and trying to educate the population and talk to the population about the things that are happening. So if that interests you, stop by. Um, and then, um, so these are one-time events that are happening. Um, Bamba, it's a Puerto Rican Brazilian dance drumming group. They're having their last event April 22nd. People Hearing People, it's a job fair happening on March 23rd. Three Penny Theater Company, one of the first theater companies that is really trying to make it here in Glendale. Um, they're doing shows called, a show called Power Plays about uh, work, place, office, uh, power play. <laughs> um, so it's going to be cool. It's going to be good. Um, and then SLC Public Lands is holding a job fair on April 5th. Um, National Victims' Rights um, uh, Resource Fair is happening on April 24th. Creative Aging is happening on June 5th. And then there's also uh, free care for your children's here at the at the Sorensen Center. Um, so if you have people who are uh, pre uh, kindergarten to sixth grade, they can be part of Youth City. Um, and if you have a teen from seventh grade to 12th grade, there's a separate program for that. Um, and then if you and then there's a summer program happening with Youth City starting 
on June 20th. And then the very last thing is uh, if you want to have pre-K uh, help with your children, they have a child uh, care facility there, but you actually have to sign up through um, the uh, register through Utah Community Action. It will be at the Sorensen Center, but you would have to register across the street at Utah Community Action. Um, so that's all that's happening in the Swanson Center. Thanks for letting me rattle off a lot. Do you have a brochure or anything that indicates like a calendar? Yeah, so I um, I have a couple of copies of that document that you uh, just saw on the screen. I don't have that many, but I can hand a couple of those out. Um, and then also if you uh, call or stop in at the Sorensen Center, it's just a few blocks that way, and they can tell you all about all the programs that's going on. Um, is NeighborWorks here? Come on up. Hello, I'm Julia Wales. I'm with NeighborWorks Salt Lake. Every time I feel like I'm behind a mic, I feel like I should have prepared some jokes, but I'm not that nice. <laughs> so. um, but yeah, I'm with NeighborWorks Salt Lake. We're an organization that's been around for 45 years. We primarily um, prioritize uh, residences on the west side. Um, we do neighborhood revitalization services. So we help people with um, home buyer education, financial education. We have a lot of funding available right now that we're trying to spread the word about for anybody that um, needs, you know, home improvement things happening or um, needs ass assistance with down payment um, stuff and mortgages and whatnot. I know housing is really difficult right now. So we're trying to get the word out about that. Um, yeah, so we do learning, lending, and community type things. But so I wanted to um, notify everybody about some of the things we have going on this month. We just had a home buyer 101 education workshop that went really well. So we're hoping to start doing that more monthly. Um, but we have a lot of funding available and down payment assistance and home improvement loans. We have, we're um, offering up to $50,000 in down payment assistance um, if you qualify. Um, and then really low rate, um, low interest rate or zero interest rate home improvement loans um, if you qualify. Um, YouthWorks is recruiting for our uh, summer cohort. YouthWorks is a 15 week program for teens ages 14 to 18. Um, they do pre-employment skills. Um, they teach you how to like build fences, paint houses and walls, but how to like write a resume and how to dress for interviews. And it, the, your, the kids get $100 a week of a stipend and we teach you how to manage that money. Um, really just encouraging life, life building, life skills, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, so we're recruiting for the summertime. Um, we also are recruiting for our Paint Your Heart Out event, which has been happening for about 30 years now. Um, I've only been at the organization for about two months now, but I'm planning it this year, so it'll be great. Um, but yeah, so if you qualify, then we'll paint your house for free. And it's a really great program. And even if you don't qualify for your home to be painted, it's a really great opportunity to meet your, your neighbors from all over Salt Lake City. It's a really popular event. We paint, we've painted hundreds of homes over the last 30 years. Um, and yeah, so it's it's a great event. So um, yeah, I believe that's it. But does anybody have any questions? I'll take applause too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So accept referrals for the youth work. Sorry. Do you accept referrals for the youth. Work? Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, the home improvement. I mean, like, uh, like, do you want to like the results certain on things you fix? Is it just within the rental area, or like? No. So it's it's all over at uh, Salt Lake neighborhoods and Murray, I believe. Yeah. And what's the name of your program? Uh, the. NeighborWorks Salt Lake is our organization. Yeah. I have some business cards and flyers and things like that. So I can leave those around and yeah, and I'll be here if you guys want to talk more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is Neighborhood House here? Neighborhood House? Uh, I didn't actually know that I was signed up to speak, but I'm a new community engagement coordinator at Neighborhood House. My name is Jake Erickson. Uh, we're always looking for new volunteers to help assist us in providing daycare services to children and adults suffering from mental and cognitive decline. Um, so 
I'll be around for a little bit afterwards. If anybody wants to know how to get involved with the community, please feel free to let me know. And yeah, let's have that conversation. Thanks. Sorry to call on you out of the blue. <laughs> um, and then I have a couple of updates from the community council. Um, the first one is from our arts committee. Um, we have a couple of updates from them. So the first is on April 29th at Three Creeks Confluence. We are hosting Art at the Confluence for a second year in a row. This is an art themed event really about celebrating the culture and arts here in Glendale. Um, last year we had a mural artist, we had uh, sculptures, we had a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, it's a completely free event. Um, we'd invite you out to that. We will publish flyers and information with our full lineup and program uh, the first week of April. So it's just over here at Three Creeks Confluence. It'll run from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So it'll be all day. Um, you can drop by any time and participate in that process uh, and in that event. Last year, it was a really, really good time. Um, and we had a bunch of different performers. So I'd encourage you to drop by. Um, the other project that our arts committee... I don't need to be on oh, camera. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the other uh, projects that our arts committee are working on, we are getting ready to do three street murals, uh, one by Parkview Elementary, one by Dual Immersion Academy, and one on 800 West. So they're all themed around the Jordan River. Um, basically, we're creating really large crosswalks across the three streets uh, to make it safer for folks to cross and to hopefully uh, slow down traffic a little bit and keep folks safe. Um, all three of those murals will start on in April, and then we'll probably do one per month, April, May, and then June. Um, and we'll, we're will we basically doing a giant paint by numbers. So we'll get information out about it, but you can come and actually help paint the murals. Um, and then the last, uh, we have two more updates from the Arts Committee. Um, the If you've used the Jordan River Trail, there are four large wood signs that run along the Jordan River with artwork on them. Um, the artwork has kind of fallen into disrepair. And so we're partnering with Salt Lake City Parks and Public Lands in the fall to refresh and update all of that artwork. So we'll be painting all four of those signs. Um, we're going to be putting out a call for artists. So if you know artists here in the neighborhood uh, or any artists that are interested in painting one of those signs, we'll be putting out a, a request for proposals for that in uh, I believe that will go out the first week of May. So watch for that. We'll be sure to email that out. Um, and then the last project we're working on is another mural. It's a large dark sky mural. So it will show the different dark skies throughout the state of Utah, um, showing just how uh, light impacts our view of the night sky. Um, we're looking at doing that under the underpass on 900 South. So where the bike pump track is and the bicycle park, uh, just under that underpass on the north side where it kind of slopes up and under, we're looking at doing a really large mural. It'll be six panels, uh, a really large mural uh, that will add some artwork there as well. Um, and also with that one, uh, since that one's on an angled slope, uh, we most likely won't need help painting it, but we will have a small festival, a uh, little event there, probably a food truck and um, some fun and games to celebrate that mural when it's done. So um, I don't have a date on that, but that one should be happening uh, later this spring. We're working with Dr. Mendoza's team at the university, um, and we're working with UDOT right now to get approval for that. So I don't have a hard date on that one, um, but we're working on it. Uh, one of the other updates from the Community Council, we are in the final stages of, of our active transportation plan. So we'll be launching a public survey, and we'll be coming out to visit different community groups over the next couple of months. Uh, but basically working on a plan that will help make active transportation safer and better in the neighborhood, identifying places for new crosswalks, maybe for signage, uh, different things like that. Um, and then also our transportation committee, we submitted a CIP application two years ago to fund a traffic safety study all along California Avenue from 9th West out to Redwood Road, really to look at making the intersection right here at Concord, and then just west of there at Glendale Drive, safer. So that process will be starting. Um, I met with the city this morning about that, and they're in the process of getting a bid out to a contractor. And the goal will be that we'll do the study and that we'll finish a crosswalk across Concord this year. 
So, um, and then in the future, hopefully that study will identify some larger projects, maybe reconfiguring the intersections. Um, we don't know what that will look like because we're going to be coming to all of you for your feedback and ideas on that. Um, the last thing from the Community Council, um, we have our Keep Glendale Beautiful Committee. They do a community cleanup the last month or the last week of every month. So in two weeks, we'll be doing a community cleanup. We will send an email invitation for where we're going to clean. Right now, it sounds like we'll be starting at the Fife Wetlands and going south um, along the Jordan River Trail. But like I said, we will email uh, and confirm those details before. Um, since we're two weeks out, we haven't scheduled it yet. We kind of wait for weather and schedule it around weather, which is pretty uh, uh, not very fun right now. I um, think that's it from the community council. Are there any other groups or people that have announcements about things happening in the neighborhood? And take those. Okay. Um, we're going to shake up the agenda just a little bit. Last time, Representative Romero had to go very, very last. So, uh, Representative Romero, do you want to come up? So, I survived the legislative session. First, I want to say that. Um, so, for those that don't know me, my name is Angela Romero and I represent you in the Utah House of Representatives. I'm also the minority minority leader of my caucus. I'm a Democrat, and so I, I'm the point person for my caucus to work with the majority caucus. So during the session, it's hard for me to get here and, and come to the community because I'm there negotiating the budget and bills with my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. And um, I'm just happy to not be in session and kind of be immersed back in community, but we passed a two point, uh, $29 billion budget. And some of the highlights from that budget would be, um, we are now going to fund full day kindergarten. So any local school district that wants to provide full day kindergarten, we will now have the option to fund full day kindergarten. Um, we did do, we did give a lot of money to public education. Teachers have gotten a significant raise, uh, the largest raise we've ever given them. But um, for me, I, I had a little bit of concerns of how we gave that raise. We tied it to um, what we call a scholarship or what I call a voucher. So now um, families can use $8,000 to send their kid from private school, from public school to a private school. But if anyone has sent a kid to public, private school like I have, um, $8,000 is not going to cover um, private school for you. And so I was I was really disappointed that they, um, my colleagues, um, decided to put those two bills together. Another bill that you'll have to watch, we did significant tax cuts, and some people like that, some people don't. But part of that bill, if we're going to, so if you get Social Security and you make under $75,000, you won't get taxed for that anymore. And um, we're um, giving, um, we're raising the level of the earned income tax. So if you have children, if you meet this criteria, you'll get more money back in taxes, but that's tied to something. So I voted against the bill because it's tied to getting rid of the education earmark. And so if you want to, it's and, and we will take away sales tax on food at a state level, just the state sales tax, not the city or county. And so if, if you, you want no sales tax on food, or on Social Security for people that make under 75,000 or EIT for families that have children. If you vote for that when it comes on the ballot, you're also voting to get rid of the educational earmark, which is the which is safe for us here when we talk about funding public education. So I just really want people to think about that before they do that. Me, when it comes to my personal legislation, my legislation, I focus on domestic violence, human trafficking, and sexual assault. So I worked with our Lieutenant Governor and we were able to secure, I think, $15.1 million to address domestic violence and, and sexual assault, which is, it's okay, but there's a, a huge need. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Murdered and Missing Indigenous and Women and Girl Task Force on Native American and Latina. And so we were able to extend that task force to do some more work with our tribal communities. And we renamed the task force Murdered and Missing Indigenous Relatives because of um, the different populations we're working with. Another thing that I'm proud of that I was able to secure was $150,000 for Rough Haven. So Rough Haven works with people who are trying to leave um, a domestic violence situation 
or they're experiencing homelessness and they don't have anywhere to take their pet. And in domestic violence situations, we've known people not wanting to leave their pet with their with their abuser. So they stay and sometimes, you know, worse things happen. And so um, by us giving that money, if somebody wants to leave a difficult situation and they have nowhere to take their pet, um, Rev Haven fosters them or they border them so that when they're in a better situation, they get their pet back. So that's really important to people. I didn't know how important it was until I ran legislation on um, including pets in, protect, in protective orders last session. So there's a lot that happened this session. If people want to talk one-on-one -on -one with me, I will, um, I'm willing to stay after and talk to you about different things that happened. And I'm also open for questions. But I don't see any questions, so I know how to shut up. I won't hear <laughs> but if you need me, you can find me right here or you can easy, just Google my name, Angela Romero. You can, you can email me or whatever. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we're going to move on to Eva from the mayor's office. Hey, everyone. Saludos a todos. Uh, give me just one second, Eva. Sorry. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Uh, go ahead now. Okay. Can you all hear me okay? I'm going to move the microphone and then we should be good. Okay. Just give me a thumbs up in the crowd if you can hear me. If not, I can get the phone closer. Hopefully you can see me. I'm visiting my grandma and my mother and we're having dinner tonight. So I didn't want to sacrifice another three weeks without seeing them. We're really close family. Um, I wanted to give an update that the RDA was able to put together a $1.34 million loan to help an additional 106 units that are located um, <clears throat> on 228 West, 1300 South at Colony B. Um, and they have uh, affordable and deeply affordable housing. So take a look at it. Um, I'm happy to put a link in here, or if you know of any residents that are neighboring and would like to move into these areas, I think it's really awesome that we can announce different housing opportunities and different type of units that are coming up in our uh, rental inventory here in the city. As well as, um, and Turner, you kind of touched on this, but I wanted to mention that 10 new Love Your Block grants are being awarded. We haven't announced it yet, so at the end of the week, uh, you should see an announcement coming up soon. But this is a specific community grant funded by John Hopkins University in partnership with Salt Lake City Corporation to fund projects surrounding the Jordan River. So 80% uh, of residents actually live adjacent to the Jordan River, which is beautiful. It's one of our most beautiful natural resources that we have in Salt Lake City. This is our second round of funding. We're hoping to continue this every year. So please take advantage of it if you hear volunteer opportunities. These are community-led, but city-funded, um, which is really important. We want communities to be able to decide what it is that they want to improve or build or add artistic uh, uh, culture or uh, neighborhood preservation in an effort to combat blight. So that's kind of the definition of this uh, programming. Um, I've been a part of it. It's really wonderful and it, it's a fun time. So I highly recommend it. Look out for information of that. I did want to announce Salt Lake City received more ARPA funds. Um, so this is kind of leftover funds from the federal government. A million dollars was applied to 42 small businesses um, with a center, central focus point being diverse owned businesses. So people from diverse backgrounds um, and making sure that they are receiving these funds. There'll actually be a second phase in the application. It'll open on March 20th and it closes on April 18th. In the chat, uh, I believe I already put the link in the chat. Yeah, so I did put the ARPA community grant chat uh, in the chat. If you wanna share that Turner um, out. As a reminder, you can be an artist, a business owner, a nonprofit, um, and they have more of the eligibility requirements on our website. We also have, uh, if, if you need accessibility help or other linguistic help, uh, you can make one-on-one -on -one appointments and the city is able to provide that for all different individuals and their needs. We also have opened up our outdoor dining grant. Um, and this is a grant where you can apply for an encroachment permit and to receive funds. That way, restaurants specifically um, can expand their square footage into the outdoor encroachment and be able to provide a larger space for community gathering and uh, um, so people can take advantage of that. Um, I'm not sure if council member went through, but the ADU uh, backlog, or excuse me, <clears throat> I wanted to discuss the ADU uh, ordinance that's being considered. There is a slight bit of a backlog. Uh, this ordinance originally passed in 2018 and now is being amended. And so I uh, just wanted to put that on your radar. It's really important um, that 
people are vocal about this issue, I'm not going to necessarily tell you your stance or what you should, but rather to say next council meeting, they'll be voting on that. So please be vocal about it. Um, <clears throat> more than anything, uh, participating in the council process is important. Uh, other than that, those are my updates, unless folks have any questions for me. Questions? What is an ADU? Accessory dwelling unit. Yeah, thanks, Turner. Yep. All right. Thank you, Eva. Uh huh. Thanks, folks. I'll see you later. Thanks. Uh, so, Council Member Pui let me know he is not going to make it tonight, but we're going to talk about pickleball. I'm going to let Salt Lake City Fire Department and then Salt Lake City Police Department go. And then I'm going to go over the Glendale Regional Park plan and show you what it says about pickleball. And then the next steps on that are that it is going to the city council, but we will talk about that in at length after uh, fire department and police department. Okay, I'll be super quick because I love pickleball, so stick with that. Right? <laughs> um, let's go over some runs, and I'm going to give our pitch for recruitment as well. Call volume is kind of different now. The station 14, I don't know if anybody knows, station 14 got moved out farther west on California. If your closest fire station run number or run a volume fire has been 67 calls this month. Medical has been about 300 calls this month uh, for a total of about 500 to 600 calls each year. Salt Lake City proper is about 5,000 calls each year. It's pretty much the standard. We've got about 30% fire, 70% medical calls. Got a, a few events, significant events in the city this year, but everything's been pretty status quo. Um, real quick, we're recruiting for new firefighters. We're always looking for great men and women to join our force. So if anybody wants to join or you know anybody wants to join, please uh, please go to www.slcfire.com and have them sign up. And I didn't even introduce myself. I'm so sorry. My name is Ty Shepard. <laughs> I'm Battalion Chief. I'm in charge of the West Side of Salt Lake City. So. Questions, usually not, or questions, comments, concerns? Okay, easy enough. Thank Great. you. All right, thank you. All right, I'll make the long walk. Um, I love following fire because everybody's in fire. Um, and I love going in front of pickleball because everybody loves pickleball, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So, um, they take them all the Police Department. I've been on the West Side for 15 years. So um, this is this is the side of the city that I really like. Uh, are there any questions, concerns that we should talk about before? Yes. We're in California. Every morning, every night. First, go around that bus every day. Okay. Hey. I know. I know. Uh -huh. 20 mile an hour sign on the street. You know, I have nothing on the ground. You can go through that. Yeah, here's my request for, for those situations. Get onto Salt Lake City Police Department website and they have a cop watch or a speed watch. You can request the address, the time of day, and they will send a motor out to enforce those. Um, I'll push it up on my end, but it's also really great to have uh, the, the community also request those. So, and that's just slcpd.com uh, in the resource center. We used to have a crime map in the resource center. It was fantastic. It's gone away, it's coming back. So that's a good thing. If you have a question about any addresses in, in your area, just pump, once it comes back, type in that address, it'll tell you all the crimes that have occurred. Sometimes it's not good to look at. I'll just leave that out there. Uh, two years, don't go anything more than six months. We'll just leave that there. Um, but it's gonna be a great resource you can use. Um, really, any other questions? Because the boring part is just the numbers. So. Uh, right now we are at um, year to date in District 2. We are uh, 41 violent crimes that have occurred in District 2. 289 non-violent crimes or property crimes that have occurred uh, year to date. So um, unfortunately we are one homicide in already and we have I believe one homicide all of last year. So that's kind of uh, disappointing because we've actually already seen that in the first three months. So that's a concern. Um, vehicle theft is down, and believe it or not, all the numbers in the, throughout the whole city are, are looking fairly promising. West Side is, is specifically down um, in crime, and that's great. We like to see that. Um, unfortunately, it's been a cold, I mean, fortunately, it's been a cold winter and a long winter. We'll see what happens when it starts to get warm. Um, that's it. It's going to be pickleball and Ethan. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, will you put a link that I shared? Okay. Um, since Councilmember Puy can't be here tonight, I'm going to go over 
what I understand to be the plan for Glendale Regional Park. And I'm gonna use the city's website to illustrate what I'm talking about. Uh, it's important for everyone to know that this plan will go before the city council on Tuesday. So the next step, if you are interested in this plan, if you have feedback, contact council member Pui because that's where it's headed next. Uh, it's kind of beyond the community council at this point. It's really in front of the city council and they're gonna be voting on this plan. So um, I spoke earlier this week with Aoife uh, and Jeremy King about the plan. And it, since then I've been able to get some clarifying questions answered. So what I understand is that phase one of Glendale Regional Park, I'm gonna call it Raging Waters so that it's not confusing. So there's Raging Waters and then there's Glendale Park next door. And I'm just gonna call it Raging Waters and Glendale Park so it doesn't get confusing. So from my understanding, phase one of Raging Waters will be built by next spring. In phase one, we can, if you scroll down, so it lays out the phasing, it lays out a variety of different things. Let's see, keep going. Uh, go back up, sorry. Up a little bit more, a little bit more, right here. Okay, um, so phase one, it says that phase one is going to add all of the amenities that are called for in phase one by spring of 2024. That includes the basketball hoop or the basketball courts and basically the entire west side of Raging Waters. I will show you the plan in just a second. Um, and then phase two, phase two is when pickleball courts will be built as part of uh, Raging Waters. But the pickleball courts are not being built at Raging Waters. They're being built at Glendale Park near the existing tennis courts. So in the short term, the city is planning to repaint and restripe three of the tennis courts to be pickleball and tennis courts, which I realize is not an ideal scenario. It's just a temporary fix until they build the pickleball courts in phase two. Um, so scroll up. We got to move over to click the vision plan online. It's the first link there. Um, so this is a, a $30 million uh, park. So phase one is the Western part of the park. Phase two includes the pickleball courts, uh, a variety of other amenities. And then phase three, which will be the last one completed, includes the pool. And the pool is the one that's going to take the longest. Phase two includes, uh, I, it includes the uh, skate park and a variety of other things, including kind of the top of the hill with the viewing center and all of that, the volleyball courts along the river, the last phase will be the community pool because it's such a large thing. Um, so what we're gonna do, I will make sure that everyone has this link. Um, I need to look up what the actual link is. I think it's glendaleregionalparkplan.com. I need to find that real quick and I'll share that before we end. Um, but I'll make sure that everyone has this because this lays out the vision for the park. The thing that I want to note about this vision plan is phase one has to be completed by spring of 2024. Absolutely has to be because the land was controlled by the federal government. There's a requirement that it has to be improved and phase one has to be ready to go by spring of 2024, which is why they're focused on a smaller part of the park with subsequent uh, phases coming in later. So um, if you'll just kind of scroll down slowly. So what I, what I want to point out is that each of the, there are numbers here as we get further down that lay out the 30 different amenities that are included in the pool or in the park. Um, and again, this is Raging Waters. All of the amenities in this plan are at Raging Waters except for Pickleball. Pickleball, which is number 30, just keep going with a Sorry, very yeah. long document. No, you're okay. Uh, okay, slow down for just a second. Um, will you take, so basically, if you're looking at this map, this right here are the existing tennis courts, existing pickleball courts. Uh, if you'll scroll or slide that over. The, the vision is, so this is basically phase one right here. You've got the basketball courts. You've got some of the other amenities right here. You've got the, in, the changed parking lot. This is phase one. Basically, this area is phase two along the river. 
And then here with the pool is phase three. The pool is in and of itself basically phase three. So the idea is that this section will be completed by 2024 with pickleball courts and this renovation done in by 2025 when phase two is completed. So we've got a two year waiting period. They're in the process of restriping and repainting those tennis courts. Um, and then when the, the funding should be released later this month and ground should be broken by the fall on phase one of the regional park of Raging Waters. Phase two will follow afterward after the completion of phase one in the spring and be done by the spring of 2025 with the pool coming online likely by the end of the year in 2025. So uh, if you'll keep scrolling down. So I wanna show kind of how to navigate this. Um, and there's a couple of things that need to be said about the plan. So the plan is a vision plan for what's gonna happen at the park. Underneath that plan, as the park is built and developed, there will be individual plans created for the different components. They'll have designers come in, consultants come in, lay it all out. So as we scroll down, uh, scroll down to number 30, it'll take us a second to get there. Um, I'm not gonna go over every amenity. Um, so you've got, you can see here, Faye, all of these numbers are different amenities. So number five is the full court basketball courts. There's a uh, an ice rink. We're going clear down to number 30. There's a dog park. Is there going to be a canoe ramp in there again? There is, yep. The one that's there is staying, and they're adding a bunch of new artwork at the boat ramp in as part of phase one. So it'll have these big fish. I don't know how to describe it. They're just giant fish that look like they're jumping out of the river. Um, so that'll be added. So here, number 30, this is what talks about pickleball. So as part of phase two, pickleball courts will be built. It says right now, west of the existing tennis courts. But this is, again, a vision plan. When they make the plan to actually build the courts and build out this area, they will plan that individually. They'll have a designer come in, they'll have a landscape architect come in, and they'll actually reconfigure that area to be built according to the standards our community wants. So the next step, for those of you that are very interested in pickleball like I am, the next step is to put pressure on the city to make sure that this is designed in the way that we want it to be designed. And the best way to do that is to continue to communicate with Parks and Public Lands and with Council Member Pui, because the council is really gonna be in the, the driver's seat here as they release the funding for the different phases of uh, Glendale Regional Park or Raging Waters. So um, the reason that this happened and the reason that they're not included in Raging Waters is because two years ago, the Community Council submitted a CIP application. CIP stands for Capital Improvement Program. Basically, these are funding proposals that anyone, any of you, Community Council, anyone in the neighborhood can submit to the city. Basically, you're writing a grant to get the city to spend its money on a project within the community. So what we did is we submitted a CIP application two years ago after I spoke with IFA about the need for more pickleball courts. We submitted that CIP application to study putting these courts on. The study was funded and done. And then once this Glendale Regional Park process went forward, they decided that because there was an existing CIP application, existing infrastructure there, that it would be cheaper, faster, and easier to add more courts in this area. It currently says west of the tennis courts, but I think that it's relatively unlikely they'll be built there. What I think is more likely is that they will rebuild the entire complex with new pickleball courts and keep the existing tennis courts. Another reason that this was done and that there has been resistance from the city to replacing any of these courts, tennis courts with pickleball courts is as they did the public engagement, there was a lot of feedback that people did not want to lose tennis courts, that they wanted to get pickleball courts, but not lose tennis courts. So the city took that and decided to add six additional pickleball courts near the existing tennis courts, rather than removing tennis courts to put in more pickleball courts. Um, 
Let me see. I think I think that's everything. But it is funded. The bond that we all voted on uh, in November funded all of Raging Waters and the addition of these pickleball courts. And so, as phase two is planned, beginning in the fall, uh, there will be an opportunity for everyone to weigh in on what the design of this looks like. Um, but right now, this vision plan is basically a broad view of what they're going to do. Each of these components, as you might imagine, requires its own design, requires its own planning. And so as phase one, phase two, and phase three are built, there will be different plans that you all will be able to weigh in on that parks and public lands will be putting together. Um, as far as understanding this plan, we will share links to the Planning Commission briefings. The Planning Commission just voted to approve the Glendale Regional Park plan, the Raging Waters plan. Um, and during the course of that, they held two public hearings on it and had an overview of every single one of the components of the plan. So we will make sure that we send that out to everyone. Um, you can also find it on YouTube, the recording on there, but we'll make sure that that's shared out. Uh, the other thing that we'll do is anytime that we hear about an opportunity for folks to weigh in, we will share those out. So if you're not on our email list, please sign in. Uh, we don't email a lot. We email once a month, unless you sign up for Keep Glendale Beautiful, then you'll get two emails a month. Um, but we send out the agenda for this meeting with a whole host of announcements, and that would include any opportunity to weigh in on Glendale Regional Park in the future. Uh, the next step for this plan is on Tuesday, the city council is scheduled to vote on this plan and they've received, a, they will receive a briefing in their work session, which is at about four o'clock. And then at seven o'clock that night, they'll hear uh, public feedback and vote on the Glendale Regional Park plan. Once the plan is approved, then all of these individual components will be planned out and we'll go before planning commission and parks and public lands will actually get to work building the regional park. So um, all of this information is information I got from parks and public lands and council member Pui. So uh, after some confusion on Monday about what was in it, got some clarifying answers. That is what I understand to be happening with pickleball at Glendale Regional Park and at Glendale Park which hopefully we can combine them and call them the same name. So questions? Jeremy, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. My question for the 17 South is always people always rushing. Every day when you play, it's free. So how should you get two, two extra walking for so far? After the set, you start out. No walk, they start feeding. Mm -hmm. And the second one, and you can make a small park in the east side, no park on the side of the street. So many people will be running around. There are some kids there racing to go to the street. So there's one, the road is too wide. You think that's it? You know, every day the people will know that the light over there, they just keep there to slow down when you see the kids walking before the light. Yeah. The only the way to slow the people down. This is it. So in, uh, I think what we can do to start solving that problem is in uh, about March, well, no, it's March, in May of this year, uh, the CIP application process will open for citizen uh, submissions. And I think what we should do is look at an application to improve pedestrian safety on 1700 South. And I think we would start with a study to identify what things would actually slow traffic there. Um, and then the second piece would be uh, actually looking at the built infrastructure. And so it would be a couple of years, but over the next you know, couple of months, I would love to get your contact information so I can work with you on this application and it will be strengthened. So the CIP application, just to, to share how it works, basically you submit a grant for something that you want to see happen in your neighborhood. It has to be more than 50,000 and less than 500,000. Um, so if it fits within those criteria, you then submit that proposal to the city and the community council will help you from step one all the way to the end. And we would be happy to help write this. Um, we, it's the same process we used for California Avenue. So we would submit that grant. It then goes to the different departments within the city. So in this case, since it's a road, it would likely be transportation. 
And then you work with staff member at transportation to develop the proposal. And then it goes before uh, an advisory board made up of citizens that look at these proposals, that score these proposals, and make recommendations to the mayor uh, on which ones to include in her budget or in their budget. And then it goes before the city council for them to approve them. So our city councilman has a direct role in approving that funding and fighting for our neighborhood to get it funded. So that's how we were able to get the California Avenue uh, transportation study done. Um, it's what we use to submit for this pickleball court. Um, it's We've used it for a variety of different things. Uh, previous years, they've applied for like the little triangle of land across from Sorensen Center uh, to become a little pocket park. So that's another example. Um, we've applied for more garbage cans all along the nine line trail and all of our public spaces. That's another example. Um, so I would love to work with you on that 1700 South uh, to get it fixed and improved. And the other thing that the community council is doing right now is working on our active transportation plan. And we're going to call out areas like 1700 South, uh, California Avenue, and those uh, that need to be improved so that we can then work with our city council and the mayor to get those projects funded um, and make the case for them in CIP applications. Um, I know it's a long-term process, um, but it's the process that the city has for doing these projects. And it, it's one that we can drive. Yeah, go ahead. Turner, I just wanted to also say that um, there are spots on the CIP boards that are vacant right now. And this district currently does not have anybody on the CIP board. Um, so if you are in this neighborhood and are interested in uh, being on the CIP board, um, you can apply and be appointed. I will get that info and send it out as well. Um, and I'm going to make a note about 17 itself. Yeah. Could I have uh, speak? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. And I'll, I'll just finish it. And then Kim. Okay. okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, thanks very much for the all the clarifications you've given us, Turner, uh, on this piece. There's been a lot of confusion. Um, and, I, and I think I, I've had a few emails from um, Kristen Riker, the um, director of, of, of Parks and Lands, and also from uh, Councilman Pui, um, and I think what they're saying more or less correlates with what you're saying now here as well. Um, I mean, this is an example of some of the confusion here. This is a very, this is one of the, the plans where they're showing uh, pickleball courts uh, as one of the versions, one of the original um, proposals, and it clearly shows that it's being part of the regional park. This now is, um, I don't know, in the middle of the night, it changed to a basketball park. Um, I'm not sure where basketball suddenly took preference. It came a from a focus group at the middle school that they did. Yeah. So they met with all the students, um, Dane Hess's class. They did a bunch of outreach at the schools and that's where it came from. Oh, the, okay. so, the students so advocated the, for so that. So the students at the middle school got the overall overriding Votes and what should be included in the park, as opposed to members of our community. Well, many of whom, are, yeah, I mean, we have a large number of people who are very much in favor of, who would agree that there's a very strong need for pickleball in that. And you know, there's a very strong. Mm -hmm. I know there, there is. Just about everyone does, and and it, it appears that the city is aware of of that dire need as well. Now we're in a situation where we're going to wait two more years. Already, you say the CRP application went in two years ago, so that's like a four-year process just to get the courts. And it's a, you know, it's, it's probably the the largest need that we have in the community. That's that's of concern. Um, part of the concerns that we have, and it's not just me. It, it, there are other, there are quite a lot of players who um, would agree that the interim so-called solution that they've got to have us wait for pickleball to be included as part of a phase two would be to do blended striping on the existing tennis courts. Um, and I feel that the city has unilaterally just made that decision for us without asking about whether that actually can work. Um, the bottom line is that it doesn't work. The reason why a lot of these players are driving all over the valley, not just the city, the valley, to go to play pickleball in, in, in other locations is because the, um, the, I think there's two courts now which have landed lines. Um, 
they do not work. Uh, you, you can't play pickleball or tennis on a court which has blended lines. And that's why nobody is using them right now. Um, so if the city wants to do that with uh, three of the courts, you mentioned three, um, and um, for, for as an interim solution for the next two years, those three courts are not going to be used. That's the bottom line. They're just going to sit there derelict. It's not a solution. We have to be able to communicate to uh, parks lands um, quite strongly that that is not an interim solution. Uh, what are, you know? What can we do? Is is maybe is an opportunity to perhaps temporarily mm -hmm. um, convert three of the tennis courts into pickleball for, for that two year period? May I don't know. Maybe that's a solution. But that's something I think we need to talk to them pretty quickly about. You mentioned that um, uh, voting approval is going to be, uh, did you say the 21st? Yeah, that's it's Tuesday, the 21st. That's, that's, and that's just on the Glendale Regional Park that, plan. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's not really affecting phase two in any way. Now, I mean, I'm just wondering if there's any input that we can give to the city that, that would be effective at this point in time, or do we need to wait for those subsequent planning opportunities that you mentioned um, is that is that effectively all we've got left i i don't have a good answer on that I, my honest opinion is to continue to contact council member pui because okay. the, he's going to have to advocate that i don't know that this can happen this is me throwing an idea out i don't know if it would be possible to get this included in phase one but i think that's what we should ask for yeah the money's there the money's been allocated. We voted for the money. Yes. We should try to advocate. We have a situation where, I mean, funding for projects that we want in our community is often the biggest problem. Um, and funnily enough, we don't have that problem now. Funding is, is in place. The money is there. It's just a question of us demanding to get what we want, uh, as opposed to um, having these decisions handed down and imposed on us by planners, people who do not necessarily have as much of a stake in, in, in the community that we do. But this is the community, this is the neighborhood that we live in. We want to be able to play pickleball here in our neighborhood. Not We don't want to have to go you know, 20 miles to, to, to play the game. So I think, yes, we do have to, um, why don't we have our council representative Councilman Thury, yeah, he had a conflict. He texted me about 30 minutes ago to tell me that. Okay. That's, I mean, he knew that this is a, this is a, a very pressing issue right now, and he's not here. So that's not, to me, that's not good now. I will continue to try to co continue to contact him and ask him to advocate for our need and hopefully influence, provide some sort of influence in the rest of the council and, and how we go forward with this. So, um, I mean, is that really, do you have any other suggestions? I think the other thing, and the community council can do this too. I think if we all reach out to the mayor's office and start asking for pickleball to be included in phase one, that's a very concrete thing. The money's there. If that were to happen, we would have six new pickleball courts by 2024, which I realize is another year, but it's one year shorter than what we're expecting. Right, and that, that would be great, yeah. And I, is that, is, can we use the community council as a conduit to perhaps do that? Yeah, um, so know, I, ahead or whatever? I think as far as process, what we should do next is I can, what I can do is draft a letter that I can get to you and Aoife yeah. to review We'll send it out to the community right. uh, and then we can get that sent to the administration and to the council. Uh, and then from that point forward, we would just need to mobilize the community to keep contacting the mayor's office, contacting parks and public lands, right. and just be a little bit annoying. Okay, yeah, squeaky wheels. Yeah, okay. yeah. a lot of squeaky wheels. And, I mean, we have, we've have we talked amongst ourselves about so, uh, essentially what our main concerns are and we'll just communicate that with you and, and just you know get some of those points included. I mean, one of, some of those things were that, um, yeah, they've got pickleball courts with an arrow pointing westwards from the yep. tennis courts. That little piece of land down at the end there really is not our deal. And I think you and mentioned that. We are to blame for that as the community council. We were just, this was before Glendale Regional Park was happening. 
we submitted the CIP application and said, ooh, where can we squeeze them? So we yeah. created a map. That's on us. But we can we, but, we can work with them on that and yeah. get something more realistic and mm -hmm. than that. But that hasn't been designed yet. That was just an idea from us. Right. And then it would have to go to design. Yeah. Okay. And Brooke, I think you Yeah, sorry. I'm on the CIP board and I will tell you that uh, we met on Monday and heard constituent requests and it was every single community council was all pickleball, all mm -hmm. all meeting long. Um and there are two courts that will be open this summer at Poplar Grove Park. Um, those will be the first ones on the west side. I think everybody on the CIP board is prioritizing pickleballs on the west side because we know that there aren't pickleballs on the west side. Um, there was another request for pickleballs over by the Fair Park um, area. So I think that the that the we recognize that there is a huge need for pickleball courts um, and that every single community council is asking for them and every park uh, is asking for them. So, um, but so I, I think everybody on the committee is really focusing pickleball on the west side. It was a CIP project. So. Yep. And it should be open this summer. Um, there to play advocate for the middle schoolers. There aren't a lot of basketball courts either. Um, and I know that that's a real oh, okay. flat that I see here in the neighborhood is that like kids are constantly yep. throwing basketballs at my building. <laughs> and I would love the basketball courts. <laughs> um, so, um, Fair enough. Yeah. So, so pickleball is like, we're hearing it and everybody on the CIP board is like prioritizing pickleball on the west side. Yeah. And, and this goes back to something you said on Monday that we shouldn't have to pick and choose between the amenities that we get. No. And I, so I don't think it's a fight between basketball and pickleball. We should get both. Yes. And I, I think the best course of action is to try to get pickle these pickleball courts right here included in phase one. Right. I think that's something we could do yeah. now. And in fact, not just both, but all three. I mean, all other sports as well. I don't think we need to have to compromise on tennis either. You know, why can't yeah. we why can't we have it all? Yeah. And and that was one of the reasons that they're hesitant to get to convert any of the tennis courts permanently to pickleball okay. is they don't want to give those up and then not have tennis courts. Right. So I think yeah. it's crazy expensive. Yeah. It's so stupid expensive. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, but we didn't ask for the home tennis court to eliminate. We asked for half. Because uh, I played I played tennis, I live in Glendale since 1987. Mm -hmm down here by the board. And I, I used to be a president of the tennis club, playing there every single day. Most of us playing tennis, we play pickleball. Yeah. And they're talking about to, to draw the line. They did it two years ago. And we played there only twice. It's not work. It's conflict on the lane because the full lane for the tennis is full on the yeah. pickleball court. Yeah. So, you confuse, but I there is none in United States I ever see they make a bigger ball court inside a tennis court. None, none. It's the cheap solution. <laughs> I saw a place in Pennsylvania. They how they do it a, a tennis court to a bigger ball. It's work, but I need the council to come there so we can show them how they do it. Yeah. So that's my only opinion on this. Yeah, and and I don't want to give up tennis courts. I don't think we should have to choose. Yeah, this is not new. Yeah, it may be useful if we, if we, we play tennis every day and we play cricket for every day, but over there we only use about three tennis courts a yeah. day, not okay. the whole eight courts. Okay. All right, tennis is my turn. Okay. All right, my name is Kipa Mudlicky. I lived in this neighborhood for forty-three years. I was the one that requested to build the tennis court, to build the back, I mean the restroom, to build the playground. And here I am requesting to build the pickup court. Okay, you have heard from China all this stuff here. Okay, and I was one of those people help planning this. Okay, let me read to you this. 
via IFA. They said from the land department or whatever. Okay. Thank you for volunteering your time to be part of the Glendale Regional Park Advisory Committee. I was one of those people. Okay. We are so grateful for the insight and feedback you have provided throughout this process. Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness, time, and input. We couldn't have come to this point without your investment. Salt City Public Lands. Mr. President, I don't do this because of the Polynesian people or Mexican or whatever. I do it for everybody. I do this for everybody so they can come together as one people in Glendale and enjoy. That's the goal, not just for the Polynesian people. I gave, I mean, I sent a long email to our city councilman. Maybe that's why he didn't show up. <laughs> but I'm telling you guys, it was so good. And I'm, I'm pretty sure he stays home and read and read it. It's a nice email to him <laughs> as he is my brother, okay? So I'm asking you guys, this one here, Phase one, as you know, you guys talk about, everybody knows about the little piece of land, too small, and they're still talking about it, okay? I don't know how many times people from the city call me, email me, we're still talking. And I try to, you know, calm myself down, okay, and listen to them. Okay, this one here, this is because this is a sign of a pickleball. It's not a basketball, but we all need basketball and pickleball and tennis over there in that park over there. Okay, I've seen the avenues. They have pickleball, they have tennis, they have basketball. Isn't it wonderful to see that? To see everybody come and play ball at the same place here in Glendale. This is the best place. I'm telling you guys. Right. And that's why I lived here for over 43 years because I love the community here. I love the people, okay? So it's too bad that he's not here, but I thank you, Mr. President, for all your good work here and your people. We are here to help you, okay? You are not alone. We are here to help and support you. Thank you, and also our spokesman here. I mean, everybody talking about pickleball, and you guys know we travel all over. And here I am sitting over here, you know, about half a block from the place. Okay? No pickleball. So I want you people tonight go home and email Pudi, okay, and ask him. Please help us out. Okay. Come out. Come and see. Okay. Come and see. Love you guys. If I offended anybody here, go home and repent. <laughs> <laughs> go home and repent and bless me. Okay. Thank you guys. Good night. Uh, one, one other thing before everybody goes home. The money in the bond that we passed in November, there's money for the regional park. That's about $30 million. In addition, there's, set, I don't know the exact figure off the top of my head. I think it is 4 million for other projects within each of the city council districts. So if there are other locations in the neighborhood where pickleball courts could go, let us know. We've looked at the Peace Gardens, We've looked, there's a piece of land just west of Three Creeks. It's the old power station, uh, power substation property. Um, I don't know how to describe where it's at. It's right along the Jordan River where the, the Nine Line and the Jordan River Trail connect. Um, so there's land there. 
But if you have other ideas for community projects, we wanna do CIP applications. We wanna make sure that we get things done. So please reach out to us. I will put together a letter tonight to Salt Lake City that I'll get to you and Jeremy and you can distribute it out and then we'll get it off by Monday. Thank you. All right. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.